This is a production of Cornell University Library. Okay, well, I officially have 401 uh, um, on my clock, so we'll, we'll go ahead and, and get things started. Um, so hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, for those who don't know me yet, I'm Sarah Wright. I'm the director of Albert R. Mann Library at Cornell University, and I'm very happy to be with you here today for the Chats in the Stacks book talk featuring the fifth edition of Snyder and Champness, Molecular Gen Genetics of Bacteria. I'm also pleased to note for those interested that the book is available for purchase as either a print or ebook through wiley.com, and you get a discount on that purchase with the use of the code that's being displayed on the slide right now. As with all of our book talks this academic year, today's event is a webinar that will involve a discussion by our speakers, Dr. Joe Peters and Dr. Tina Hankin, followed by questions posed from the audience. I invite you to post your questions to our speakers at any time during today's event using the chat function in the webinar. My colleague, Evelyn Ferretti, will be gathering all questions for presentation to our speakers during the Q&A portion of today's program. I'd like to pause for a moment to acknowledge that Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gaiacono. The Gaiacono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gaiacono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gaiacono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. And now it's my honor to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Tina Hankin is Professor of Microbiology, uh, Robert W. and Estelle S. Bingham Professor of Biological Sciences and Distinguished Professor, University Professor at The Ohio State University. She is a Fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and is a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Hankin received her PhD in genetics from the University of Wisconsin. From there, she went on to hold a postdoctoral position in molecular biology and microbiology at Tufts University Medical School before joining the OSU faculty. Her research funded continuously by the National Institutes of Health since 1987 focuses on the analysis of the mechanisms through which cells sense changes in their environment and transmit that information to the level of gene expression. Widely published in major peer-reviewed journals, Dr. Hankin's work has established a new field of study focused on developing a better understanding of RNA, not simply as a messenger, but also a regulatory molecule that guides gene expression Dr. Joe Peters is a professor of microbiology at Cornell University and director of the graduate program in microbiology and, uh, as of just a week ago, chair of the department as well. He has had a career-long interest in gen genomic stability and chromosome evolution, especially how these are impacted by mobile DNA elements. He is particularly interested in the molecular mechanism transposons use to limit damage to the host and maximize the process of horizontal transfer. Professor Peters received his PhD at the University of Maryland at College Park, and before joining the faculty at Cornell, he held a position as a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. As a founding member of what is known as the R3 group here at Cornell, a group of Cornell scientists from a variety of departments who have been meeting regularly for almost 20 years to collaborate around the topic of DNA replication, recombination, and repair, Professor Peters is a great example of the cross-disciplinary exchange so highly valued at this university and so essential to progress in science. Professor Peters' own work in mobile genetic elements has been credited for laying the groundwork for some exciting recent advances in treating life-threatening genetic disorders. The book being presented today, Snyder and Champness, Molecular Genetics of Bacteria, made its debut as an important textbook for the teaching of molecular biology in 1997. With the enormous advances that have occurred in the study of genomics since then, the book has seen extensive updates. Now in its fifth edition, thanks to collaboration between Drs. Hankin and Peters, it continues to be known as the single most comprehensive and authoritative textbook on bacterial molecular genetics. 
Please join me in welcoming Professors Hankin and Peters as they tell us of their work on this vital teaching tool and the changes it reflects in our understanding of molecular biology over the past two and a half decades. Great, thank you so much for that. And thank you for, for doing this as well. I think it's a nice uh, thing to do for authors here at Cornell. Uh, and even though it would have been most fun to do this uh, in person, I'm also glad that we're doing it virtually because it allowed my co-author Tina to join us. So this is a, this is a special treat. Uh, one of the topics that we, we wanted to talk about this was why we do what we do. Uh, and uh, part of it has to do with this being a book that's done by an organization that all microbiologists hold really dear to each other, the American Society for Microbiology. So this is an advocacy group, an education group uh, that is run by microbiologists for microbiologists. Uh, and even though it's the American Society of Microbiology, it really is an international organization. So about half of the members are actually outside of the United States of America. So. We're really proud to be part of something that is really giving back to the community uh, in that way. Just as one little extra thing with our heart going out to the people in Ukraine and uh, some of the stuff that the ASM is doing to help support that as well. So we started off talking a little bit about why did we do this? Um, why did we get involved in, in this project? And this uh, depicts how the book has evolved over the course of um, uh, the years since it was first started by Larry Snyder and Wendy Champness. And they were really responsible for the, the first three editions 100% uh, on their own. And uh, Joe and I both used this book to teach. We both loved the book, um, but we also started to recognize that there were places where it really needed an update. And uh, Larry and Wendy really wanted some help in, in making this happen. And so Joe and I got involved for the fourth edition. And um, for that edition, we really focused primarily on updates, correcting things that had changed in the field, um, adding things that needed to be amplified, changing the balance a bit. Um, it was a very E. coli centric book. Uh, the field has opened up more and more to uh, uh, investigation of other organisms. And so we added more of that. And then, but we kept the basic structure of the book. The, the chapter organization was essentially unchanged. When it came to the fifth edition, Joe and I sat down and decided that maybe this was our opportunity to really look hard at the structure of the book and see if there were some things we wanted to reorganize. And so we did some things like combining two chapters that were on bacteriophages into a single chapter and reorganizing how that information was presented. Um, Joe added a final chapter that focuses on genomics and uh, uh, pro molecular approaches. Um, and the big change that we made is that we went from uh, just a few colors in each figure to full color. And that's to some extent reflected by what you see on the cover. And we'll talk more about that um, as we go along. Um, another thing that uh, we want to emphasize is that whenever you add something to a book, it's essential to take things away so that the size of the book doesn't grow and grow out of control. And that's really where the hardest decisions have to be made. Um, because we like what was in the previous editions, we would like to keep it but we have to make those decisions. And then the other thing that uh, we really tried to maintain that uh, Wendy and Larry started from the beginning is the use of, of simple, plain language that allows students to read these uh, chapters and really understand what's going on without a lot of jargon. And uh, one of the nicest things that I heard about the book was that our copy editor, who uh, is an English, was an English major, said that she, in fact, understood what our, the content was in the book. So that made me very happy. OK, Joe? Great, thanks. Yeah, one of the things that has caused these huge changes over the years since 1997 has a lot to do what we've learned through DNA sequencing. Uh, so at the time of the first edition, was only one or two bacterial genomes had been done. Uh, if you fast forward to recent time, we almost have a million freely available bacterial genomes 
that you can download, including sequences from, from environments. So this has radically changed the way we've looked at biology, uh, something that took you know, millions of dollars to do the first genome. Now, if you can cough up $80 within three days, you can get a bacterial genome done. So the, the, the landscape has really changed. Uh, and I thought it would be fun just to put some examples from even the third to the fourth to the fifth edition of what the family tree of life looks like as depicted uh, in the book. And what we can learn from this is really putting together this family tree. So as without going into it too much, it's really radically changed our understanding of the relationship between these organisms. Even organisms that we can't actually grow in the laboratory by sequencing directly from environments, we can find things like this whole branch that was unknown before called the candidate phyla radiation. So this has been a really watershed moment for, for, for molecular microbiology and learning what we learn here and really taking the place of bacteria and the incredible diversity and importance it has uh, for our planet. Uh, as we'll talk about, uh, all the chapters have different significant themes uh, that we're interested in, uh, but I wanna point out one of the newer ideas that evolved over the years uh, is the appreciation that one group of, uh, th th there's three domains of life known, but that the eukaryotes actually group out of this type of microorganisms, the archaea, and actually there's this first sequence representative, uh, a free living one that we were able to, or has been able to uh, grown independently, uh, was found just uh, a couple of years ago near the time when we were publishing the book that has been really exciting to us. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that um, changed dramatically in the fifth edition is that we went from just a couple of color choices in every figure to full color. So the availability of the full range of color. And we decided early on in, in our work on this edition that we could take advantage of this um, to really make elements uh, be both in terms of color, line, type, all of those things to be consistent through every figure in throughout the book. So for example, DNA is always a black line um, if we're just kind of talking generally about DNA, if it's a um, specific sort of thing, it's a blue line, RNA is green and, and wiggly and things like that. Um, what this meant is that literally every single figure in the book had to be redone from scratch. And uh, we worked with a great scientific illustrator um, named Patrick Lane uh, through uh, ASM, and he helped us to do this. But it meant that every figure required lots of iterations back and forth between um, whoever was responsible for a given uh, section of the book to the illustrator and back to the other author and back. Um, so we really worked to make sure that everything was um, accurate, consistent, and as, as clear as possible. Yeah, very easily. 50% of the work, you would think maybe naively going in that the text and keeping up on the newer ideas would be the biggest part, but figures are really important and a part of the book and something we're really uh, proud about and something we want to give you a little insight into the process. Uh, so what we would do is either in a rough PowerPoint or in something we would draw up our own little hand, uh, an example of what the artist, we wanted the artist to do. So the change for the cover this year was to really put emphasis on CRISPR-Cas systems. So I think CRISPR-Cas isn't just an esoteric uh, microbiologist, a biologist term now that people know it as a mechanism for manipulating human genomes and animal genomes and plant genomes. It's become uh, really more uh, known uh, in, the, in the public, uh, but this is something that's really foundational to molecular genetics uh, in general. So we would give these sketches to the artist and then they would try and realize that vision and that has been a really important step. And as Tina, totally correctly pointed out, it was a lot of iterations back and forth, almost comical at times, but we really wanted to make sure it was just right so our students would really understand this material. Another thing that we added to the book this time is that at the beginning of each chapter, um, where we had the table of contents, we would add um, a, a figure that just illustrated some key concept that we thought would be interesting to the readers and um, something that they might be interested in. So this is one of those examples. And in, in this case, this is a chapter that's on uh, how genes get expressed and how that gets measured. And what you're looking at in this figure on, 
it is a, a set of constructs or cells containing constructs where uh, the regulatory region of a gene is fused to a fluorescent reporter. And when we see fluorescence, like on the right side, that means that that gene is being expressed. So um, this is directly connected to the content of the chapter, but it's also pretty to look at. And so we wanted to, to marry those two things, uh, things in these introductory pictures that were um, visually interesting or conceptually interesting um, and directly connected to whatever was in the chapter. Right, yeah, and an emphasis on pretty. I mean, there's a lot of pretty stuff going in structural biology now. We have had crystal structures as a way to look at individual molecules uh, in the past, but there's this burgeoning field of cryo-EM where you can look at much larger structures and complexes of proteins. It's given a really nice way to understand biology, but they're also just visually pleasing. So it was kind of fun to think of something that was a connection to the actual text, as Tina said, but also was kind of pretty to look at and, and maybe even useful. Another area that we tried to emphasize, um, at least in, in, in some sections, was some of the history of, of how various discoveries were made and, and who made them as a person. And in this particular case, we wanted to emphasize the contributions of Esther Lederberg, um, which sometimes have faded into the shadow of uh, her more famous husband, who received the Nobel Prize for work that really the two of them did together. Um, Esther was responsible for uh, replica plating, which was a key technique for um, identifying mutations and figuring out how mutations actually happen in um, bacterial populations. She was also crucial to the discovery of lambda phage and the fertility plasmid. So we wanted really to bring out her uh, role in this. And in particular, um, we noticed that today, that, that this month is the 70 year anniversary of when this crucial paper came out that described replica plating. And I found this especially interesting because um, this work was done at the University of Wisconsin, where I did my graduate work. And in the laboratory where I did my graduate work, we had up on a shelf one of the original replica plates that Esther Lederberg made uh, up in a place of honor up on that shelf. And so I always felt connected uh, to her contributions to the work. I'll also point out the uh, photo where the place we got this photo, the estherletterberg.com website that has a lot of historical material on it and information. Uh, so uh, you're going to do some Tina. Here's another pretty one that, that I picked for a chapter on transformation, which is a process by which bacterial cells can pick up DNA from their environment. And this is a really cool set of, of images from the Dahlia lab where what you're looking at in green is a, a cell of uh, Vibrio cholera, and that extension in green is a pillus that the cell sticks out into the environment, and it goes waving around looking for pieces of DNA, that's those little red blobs, and when it finds one of those little pieces of DNA, the pillus retracts, that's what you see on the right, and brings the DNA back to the cell. So this is new insight into ways in which cells can acquire DNA and therefore acquire new information from other organisms in their environment. So we're gonna have a few slides where we talk about some of the advantages we've seen in moving from the three color version before to full color. So as Tina alluded to, it was an incredible amount of work. I don't know how many hundreds of illustrations they were, but consist making all of the uh, features consistent and putting in color was a huge, huge undertaking and uh, helps account for some of that gap between the fourth and fifth editions uh, as we took over. Uh, so one example here, I hope you agree that it's much more visually pleasing and I think the information uh, lends itself more in the full color where the uh, old black and white version is almost out of like a silent film or something like that, showing its uh, age uh, also and how some of these concepts have grown uh, over the time. And here's another uh, version where you can see how color helps. Um, in this case, we're looking at the LAC operon, which is the classic uh, case that everyone uses as the model for how 
transcriptional regulation occurs in bacteria. And using color, we could illustrate all of these different regulatory sites. And then all of these colors were maintained in additional figures that covered the same kind of material. And in addition, down at the bottom, you can see how using color in a, a three-dimensional um, structure of a protein can really help you to pop out individual domains that have different functions or the sites of various mutations. And so using the full color really made things much clearer for us. We wanted to show an example here for uh, a couple of, of reasons. One, for how color could be much more helpful than the original black and whites uh, were done, even if the, the uh, aspects hadn't changed so much. Uh, what's indicated here without much explanation was how a virus of bacteria, the most famous one, one that Esther Lederberg discovered, phage lambda, uh, definitely the most studied uh, virus, is able to cut out of the chromosome where it exists as like a latent infection to form its own circle that can then get packaged into virions and then kill the cell. But obviously how it chooses to do this is very highly regulated. Uh, I'm very proud to say that my uh, postdoctoral advisor, uh, Nancy Craig, was the actual one that discovered it. And one of the reasons I'm additionally uh, pointing out this discovery is, is that it also turns out she was a Cornellian here uh, as well. So her, she was the first graduate student with Jeff Roberts, another longtime Cornellian professor here. Uh, and to uh, have the small world aspect continue, the actual building where she did this work as a graduate student is the building where I'm sitting right now, a wing hole at, at Cornell University. And just a picture here uh, of Nancy and Jeff when she was in town and we had dinner at our place. So uh, really nice uh, connection to Cornell too, which I'm happy to point out. This is another example where we can uh, use full color and um, various components to, to, to create figures that, that have some fun in them, like a little Pac-Man, a uh, little <laughs> skull and crossbones um, that let us illustrate things like um, stuff that gets destroyed, stuff that gets, uh, that's poisonous to cells. And um, this topic of toxin and antitoxin systems and plasmid maintenance is a really hot area where even since we published the book, there have been major changes. So this is an area that we we see we will we already know we will need to update. And it also um, illustrates the importance of systems that cells use to protect themselves um, from uh, plasmids and from phages from foreign DNA. Um, and these are systems that include CRISPR, which is what Joe is going to talk about next. Right, yeah, probably one of the most exciting and fastest growth areas in this, in this uh, pitched battle between bacteria and the viruses that affect them. I don't know off the top of my uh, head that the actual numbers behind it, but the number of bacteria that are being killed by viruses all the time is just astronomical. And just given the ancient nature of bacteria and the sheer numbers of bacteria and the viruses that affect them, it's set off this huge, huge... Uh, battle and there's defenses and counter defenses and counter counter defenses that are just really exciting to look at uh, and the level of evolution but then also yet again even more important is the molecular ingenuity you see in there so as we've kind of alluded to a couple times this new technology that's just called by CRISPR the name is completely uh, uh, unhelpful for knowing what it does has led to this ability to modify genomes, human and otherwise, uh, in a way that people never thought possible. So also uh, a recent Nobel Prize from uh, Jennifer Doudna, and I always mess up the pronunciation of Shepard Yeh's uh, discovery of this process, and the ability to modify genomes doing it has really been a watershed uh, moment in promising uh, human uh, therapeutic uh, and if anything that should be possible, but also in model systems to be able to do things that we were, we never thought were possible. Uh, so it turns out this is a system that uh, is found in bacteria and used for their defense. So these systems can be uh, reprogrammed. They can uh, evolve just like our uh, adaptive immune system do where previous exposure to a virus or genetic element of some kind can then prime that system. So if that same element tries to come back again, that it can be destroyed and protect the bacteria. 
Uh, so the trainability and programmability of this uh, is really something that can be used to, to, to modify DNA in any of the domains of life, as we said. Uh, something that was not at all firmly appreciated for many of the editions of this textbook was the actual complicated nature of this. So there were some components of it, I won't go into it here in purple, that are shared by these systems. But really, in every one of these other cases, it completely re-evolved from scratch. So evolution made the same good decision in uh, many multiple times uh, in, in what's called convergent evolution, where it does the same thing, but uh, evolved completely independently. Uh, so now it's known, and this was a big part in changing maybe something that had maybe two or three pages that is now a big part of the new uh, chapter that got added to the textbook. So we have these single component systems. The most famous is uh, Cas9, uh, has been used in many of the initiating technologies, but then it was found that there was other single component uh, uh, effector molecules that could do this and multi-subunit ones uh, that have really been keeping being discovered and new variations on it that are having these totally new, incredible areas, uh, most recently in a lot of ways for uh, even detecting things like COVID in a very inexpensive and low resource kind of a, a way that can be useful uh, for a lot of things. Uh, I put down some of the archaic names for some of these, but these are really become very important tools uh, in medicine for detection and for uh, treatment possibilities going forward. Uh, another thing that we try to do on this completely new chapter uh, was sort of how do you actually uh, do some of these things? So it's a little bit of a how-to guide and and how this works. Uh, and one of the things I want to point out here, uh, and Tina's going to talk about it a little more uh, as well, is, is that we try to listen to our, our, our customers. You know, we try and listen to our students. We listen to people in the field like, hey, wouldn't it be good if you cover something like that? Uh, and, and this is one example of this. Uh, while uh, in my class, a lot of I was teaching some of these new techniques that would be used for, for uh, constructing new DNAs. Uh, so uh, something that I, I guess I didn't introduce yet is that we've learned this ability to read information out of the world and the environment and with these, you know, almost a million bacterial genomes that we have, but we're also learning how to write really well. So synthetic DNA and synthetic uh, techniques are now used to be able to construct things completely de novo that we can put even entire bacterial genomes completely de novo uh, one of the sort of grandiose ways that some talked about it is you can make an organism whose uh, mom and dad were actually a computer code that actually imagined it up and was made, you know, without anything beforehand. So it really is a, a very exciting time. Uh, but something the students ha had wanted to know too is, well, well, when do I use procedure A over procedure B? You know, so that kind of helped with a figure like this, where you could see advantages and disadvantages and cost versus. Uh, other attributes of um, for making completely synthetic uh, things and cloning them into bacteria. So we've talked, um, spent most of our time talking about uh, how this book has changed from the previous editions and how we made some of the decisions that we made about what we wanted to cover. Um, and although I think Joe and I are both still in denial of in thinking about the sixth edition, um, we recognize that that's something we should already be thinking about a bit. So what sorts of things do we think um, we will want to do next? Number one, these fields are moving very quickly. So there is new information coming out all the time. So we'll want to do more updates. There are new classes of antiphage defense systems like CRISPR um, that are being discovered very recently, and maybe these will also provide new tools just as CRISPR has done. Um, there's a lot of interest recently in using phage in antimicrobial therapy. As we run out of antibiotics, uh, we need new ways to uh, block infection, to cure um, infectious diseases, and understanding about how phage work and how they can be used is an important part of this. Um, we're looking for uh, following up on new insights into regulatory networks. Again, as new tools emerge for how to study these, we learn more about them. And so I think that's a topic that we'll develop more. 
Uh, there's always more information coming out about genomics, metagenomics, and communities in nature. So how do organisms interact with each other in our bodies, in the soil, in the water, all of these different places? How can we uh, examine this kind of, these kind of networks of organisms interacting with each other? One thing we really wanted to do for this edition, and it was just sort of beyond the capability, is to add in some animations. And so we've already started working with ASM Press on that and hope to be um, adding some of those, uh, at least online, uh, for the textbook that we have now. But we certainly hope to do more of that for the next edition. And we're always open to suggestions. So as Joe mentioned, we try to listen to our customers. Before we started the fifth edition, we sent out a survey to all of the instructors that we knew of who were using this book, and ASM Press keeps a list of this, and we just asked, what, what do you like? What don't you like? Where do you see places that we should expand or contract, or what, what sorts of things do you think we should do in this book? And we plan to do that again before the sixth edition. And I have to say, I already have a folder on my desktop um, called Molecular Genetics of Bacteria 6, <laughs> where I stick in various ideas that I come up with, either from talking to people uh, or from seminars or from reading papers. Uh, and I'm always looking for new things to put into that folder. Please let us know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cool. I think that's everything we had. If we want to open it up to questions, we'd be very happy to talk about anything people want to know. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Tina and Joe. That was just fascinating. It was great. Lovely uh, overview and, and, uh, and, and preview uh, of, of um, what's to come still. So um, do so. I'm just going to remind everybody. My name is Evelyn Ferretti. I am the uh, public programs administrator here at Man Library, and I am here to present the questions that you pose into chat to our speakers. So please feel free um, for those of you that are here with us to um, give us your questions into the chat into the chat box here. So I'm going to start with one that I've received from Samuel. He has asked, um, "What has what motivates you? Given the time, you've mentioned how how how." Um, how time consuming it was actually to do that update, especially the from, from, from black and white to, to full color. What, um, what motivates you to, uh, to continue this, this, this project? I, I can go first, I guess, cause you just spoke, but uh, well, for me, I was, yeah. I mean, everything that Tina said, of course, you know, that we saw it was a good product, but needed to be updated and go kind of go to the next level. Uh, I have taught bacterial genetics since I've been here at Cornell. I used the textbook all along uh, and loved it. But as I learned new materials, I learned things that like boots on the ground, teaching students seem to be really effective ways for them being able to pick up the information. Uh, you know, I tried to impart that in the textbook as good ways to present it to other students. Uh, so that was really, uh, really important for me to do. And it is daunting. Uh, it's just so much literature that's coming out all the time, even as a, like a, when, even when you're up to speed now, just keeping up with the new literature is impossible. But now we're asking our students to get on this energy, this uh, like uh, entry ramp on the highway of information. They have to kind of catch all the old stuff to get to the new stuff. And you really need tools like this to try and make it digestible, plainly written to try and get people up to speed, or you're, you're just not gonna have people able to, you know, to, to learn this kind of material. We also both hear regularly from um, fa faculty uh, scientists from around the world who, who say how useful the book is to them, not only in their own teaching, but just in their ability to keep up with the field and, and um, having everything sort of condensed in one place just helps them to feel that they're up, up with what's going on or they use it as a reference. If they just need to be reminded how some detail of how transcription works or how translation works, they know that they can go to our book and it's it, nothing is ever completely 100% up to date because the field changes so quickly, but it's a great source for them to just get a handle on, oh yeah, that's how that works. Now, I may know DNA replication, recombination, repair, and, and we very actively in that, but 
transcription translation, some of these other topics, I might not, you know, so it, it and everybody's that way. It's just gotten too specialized. We're really happy to provide something like this that can give it even people in the field and especially people who aren't in the field to give them a way to kind of just ease into it. Uh, that's more than a Wikipedia search or something like that, you know, a little more authoritative and more clear and really written, you know, taking the science in mind. Joe's point about a Wikipedia search is, is really important because I've occasionally done a Wikipedia search on some topic just to see. And the amount of incorrect information that is out there, if you just Google a topic, um, is striking. And, mm -hmm. and so to some extent, we are trying to help out the, the field of biology overall by providing accurate and clear explanations of things that we hope people can use. Yeah, that's great. That is always a good reminder. Thank you for that. The, the <laughs> library, this says, this says the library too, the, the, the plug for the good information. Right, good. Um, and I have a, a question for, um, from Susan asking, what have you not included? What are some of the things you've actually not included, you know, had to sort of chuck uh, from, from this present iteration and, and, and why? How did you make yeah, that choice? Okay, I can, I mean, some of it is old, you know, and I've heard that we like, we're not teaching history, you know, we're teaching contemporary uh, science, you know, so you can't learn what's new and without learning some old, but, you know, some of it, you know, you can imagine it comes out. It's not the way that people do it these days anymore. And so some of that seems kind of obvious, uh, but it, it is always hard, hard for, and we don't want, uh, you know, a current teacher to be like, oh, what happened to X, Y, and Z? I used to like to teach that as well. So, so that part is tough. Uh, I would say maybe even a, a trickier part, and I think Tina will probably have stories like this, is that not all science is settled, right? You know, there are conflicts and ideas and different models on things. So you need to choose, you know, kind of, I won't call it the winner or something, you know, or, or one opinion. You know, if it's really complicated, you may try and give both ideas, but at some levels, you, you almost have to, you know, decide one thing just to make it readable and understanding. So, I mean, th those parts actually do make it uh, really complicated stuff that's on the really, really cutting edge uh, of science. It's, it's tricky, you know, to, to really to pin down in that way. I don't know if Tina has other examples of that. Well, I mean, I, I would just agree that we have, have to try and be sure that what we're including is, is really very well established and clear. And so sometimes something that is brand new and has just come out, but hasn't there hasn't been enough follow-up studies to um, a a assess whether this new idea is really a representation as opposed to maybe something idiosyncratic. Um, those are the kinds of decisions that we have to make. Uh, the other kinds of decisions, um, I'll just give an example, is um, say in the uh, the older versions of the book spent a lot of time uh, in, in discussing transcriptional regulation, going through the uh, original model systems in great detail in terms of how these systems were uncovered. And I love that stuff, but I wanted to bring in more post-transcriptional control, translational control, other types of things. And so rather than um, follow up multiple systems, I just chose which ones of the transcriptional ones to cover in detail and cut some of the other examples out, or at least cut down how much was discussed. Right. And we did try and keep, as Tina said, I mean, one of the things we liked about the book, we continue to like the book, is that trust not to give only raw facts sitting in space, but some of the experiments that actually allow them to, to show that. We're really trying to teach our students to be the new innovators, the new discoverers. You don't learn that just by hearing about the final product, you learn about it by hearing about the process. Uh, but that also takes a lot of time. So that's a place where we've trimmed some, but definitely made a point to leave a, a bunch as well. Like, how do we discover something completely new? You know, like, there's actually a process to it, uh, and it's exciting to give students a sense for that. Great, fair enough. Um, so then this next question is from Sarah. You you mentioned animations as a possible next edition to the to the sixth edition. Um, so Sarah, would be curious what elements or contents you think would be good candidates for animation. What what do, what do you what are you know what 
what areas will be animated in, in your sixth edition? Yeah, so I mean, we're actually working on some examples now, and we'll see if we can roll out more, and that they'll be out on the website, or maybe we'll release them through Science Twitter or something like that. But uh, I would almost say, which figure wouldn't be good by animation, you know, living processes or moving processes. Some are really obvious, like DNA, how they move and twist and supercoil are some of the ones we're experimenting with. First, how a replication fork moves along the DNA is another really complicated process because you need a very highly accurate collection of enzymes that moves along as a platform. It's like building the railway while you're riding the railway tracks uh, and there's all these things moving back and forth that I would just love to see uh, in, in some of these animations. Uh, export, yeah, transcription, you know, how translation follows behind transcription, really ton of, of, of really nice examples that I think would be much more clear. Uh, the, the artist was really good. You could do a lot with moving lines and multiple panels, but wow, to see some of that as a moving figure would be would be really fun to see. Right, I, I think you covered the, the main points that I would make as well. Things like transcription and translation, where it's really a machine um, that is carrying out a process. So being able to watch the machine do its work um, as opposed to having static snapshots, um, I, I think would just make it much clearer to students to see how this is all working. Everybody learns uh, differently too, you know, so I think it's also more inclusive to have those more visual learners if they can learn from a moving figure as well. Great. Good. And now I'm going to actually touch on a question I started to ask you before this, and that is the question of what areas, you know, as these as this area grows, it's gotten sort of so complicated, so comp so fascinating, so <laughs> bigger, I guess, in some ways, let's say mm -hmm. just more complex. What areas for younger students, not, a, not, not a university students, would you say for teachers of those students that they should be encouraging their student, their, um, their, uh, their, um, their students to to cover to 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 uh, to explore, and, and the teachers themselves should maybe consider in incorporating into their curriculum. Well, I, I mean, I can say from um, my own daughter's experience, um, she was a senior in high school the year that the AP Biology test um, changed from being fact oriented to being data analysis oriented. Can you read a figure? Can you read it? Um, a graph, can you um, take data and put it together and interpret it? Um, and, and so those sorts of skills, rather than just memorization of facts, I think is crucial in any field of science. And to be honest, I think it's crucial for all citizens of the world to be able to use information in that way and not just listen to what people tell them as the result, but to be able to look at the numbers that are coming out with COVID or something like that and, and interpret the data and, and understand what it really means yourself. Um, so I think those fundamental skills of how to process information and ask questions about that information and draw conclusions um, is the most important thing for young people to learn to have them just, even if they don't become scientists, but to be able to understand the world around them. Yeah, totally agree, nothing to add to that. I guess the one other thing I'd say is math skills are crucial. Um, uh, people tend to think about, well, I will never use this in my life. Why do I need to know that? Um, the ability to understand a linear scale versus an exponential scale um, I think was crucial in the ability to understand what was happening with the COVID numbers when they were going sky high. Um, and and um, simple uh, or relatively simple math concepts are, are really crucial for people to have so that they're not afraid of math, but rather see it as the tool that it is. Yeah, something that's Okay, good. Well, that actually, I think, wraps up our questions for, for, for the day. Um, thank you so much. And now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Yeah, great. Thank you, Emily. Um, and many thanks uh, to you, Tina and Joe, for the fascinating behind the scenes look you've given us into making into the making of an essential textbook in microbiology. 
and also for the guided tour along some of the rapidly changing frontiers of that field that came in with your discussion. What a great way to spend a midweek hour. Uh, so before we close, I would just like to mention that the library does have several more book talks coming up on a wide variety of topics, from an ethnography of a highland culture along the Burma-China border to the personal reflections of a Cornell economist about lessons learned doing high-level international economic policy work. You can find the lineup of the semester's remaining book talks at the link that's being typed into the chat box now by Evelyn. Uh, and with that, uh, I thank you again, Professor Hankin and Professor Peters uh, and all of our audience members for joining us today. Uh, I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you. I'll, I'll just add in, um, uh, if anyone has questions that come up later, please feel free to contact either one of us. Um, I'm hinkin.3 at osu.edu. Joe.peters at cornell.edu. Should be easy. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you both again so much. This has been a production of Cornell University Library.